It's the reading of today, so I don't trip. So uh, the book will be open here, just flip it on the raid, and just have one there. And then, okay. Could you, in order, come up and sit beside Liz, because Liz is reading, and the two of you just come up together, Liz and you. The lady in the about five rows back, uh-huh. could you just sit beside her? Sit beside her, okay. You owe me big time. And then once you've read it, that's right. being sung. Right. We'll just lift the book down and shove it underneath. Right. And then can I go and sit down? Then you can go and sit down. Do we do the first bit? Come up with the first read? Yes. That need uh-huh. all come up yeah. here. Okay.
Francis, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, to our beloved son, Francis Dugan, of the clergy of the Diocese of Motherwell, and until now, parish priest there of the parish of Our Lady of Lourdes, and chosen as the Bishop of Candida Casa or Galloway, health and blessing. Called in Christ by providence, and also predestined according to the plan of him who does all things in conformity with the counsel of his will, that we might be for the praise of his glory, and while burdened as we are with solicitude for the whole church, we know the riches of divine grace, and so we are gladly accustomed to distribute the offices of honour and the power of governance over the holy people of God to those who excel for their honesty of life and dedication to the commandments of Christ. Reflecting on such reasons for the pastoral office, our mind has turned to the spiritual needs of the Sea of Candida Casa or Galloway, which rendered vacant after the transfer of our venerable brother William Nolan to the Archdiocese of Glasgow, awaits a legitimate moderator of its diocesan life. We have therefore thought of you, beloved son, who are seen to be endowed with the human and priestly gifts which make you suitable to bear these responsibilities. Hence, on the advice of the dicastery for bishops and by our apostolic authority, we have appointed you as bishop of Candida Casa or Galloway, conceding you the required rights and imposing on you the corresponding duties attached to this office. In observance of the liturgical norms, you may receive Episcopal ordination anywhere outside Rome by any Catholic bishop. You must beforehand make the profession of faith and take the oath of fidelity to us and our successors in accordance with ecclesiastical law, with special affection, and through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of St. Margaret, the patroness of your cathedral church, we encourage you, beloved son, to be always there for your faithful, especially the humble and the poor, who moved by your word and example, may be able to place their true hope of salvation in God. Given in Rome, at the Lateran, on the 22nd day of the month of December, in the year of our Lord, 2023, the 11th of our pontificate, Francis. With faith in Jesus Christ and with love in my heart, I accept the pastoral care of the people of God in the Diocese of Galloway. I promise to serve faithfully the church in this diocese, to preach the gospel and celebrate the Eucharist.
Let's just pray. O God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the second book of Chronicles. All the heads of the priesthoods and the people too added infidelity to infidelity, copying all the shameful practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord that the Lord had consecrated for himself in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, tirelessly sent them messenger after messenger since he wished to spare his people and his house. But they ridiculed the messengers of God. They despised his words. They laughed at his prophets, until at last the wrath of the Lord rose so high against his people that there was no further remedy. Their enemies burned down the temple of God, demolished the walls of Jerusalem, set fire to all its palaces, and destroyed everything of value in it. The survivors were deported by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. They were to serve him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. This is how the word of the Lord was fulfilled 
that he spoke through Jeremiah. Until this land has enjoyed Sabbath rest, until 70 years have gone by, it will keep Sabbath throughout the days of its desolation. And in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord that was spoken through Jeremiah, the Lord roused the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, to issue a proclamation and to have it publicly displayed throughout the kingdom. Thus speaks Cyrus, king of Persia. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has ordered me to build him a temple in Jerusalem, in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his peoples, may his God be with him. Let him go up. The word of the Lord. is my light and my help. The Lord is my light and my help. The Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. God loved us with so much love that he was generous with his mercy. When we were dead through our sins, he brought us to life with Christ. It is through Christ, it is through grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him and gave us a place with him in heaven in Christ Jesus. This was to show for all ages to come through his goodness towards us in Christ Jesus, how infinitely rich he is in grace. Because it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by anything of your own, but by a gift from God, not by anything you have done so that nobody can claim the credit. We are God's work of art, created in Christ Jesus, 
to live the good life as from the beginning it was meant us to have, to live it. The word of the Lord. <laughs> The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to Nicodemus, The Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. No one who believes in him will be condemned, but whoever refuses to believe is condemned already, because he has refused to believe in the name of God's only Son. On these grounds is sentence pronounced, that though the light has come into the world, men have shown they prefer darkness to light, because their deeds were evil. And indeed, everybody who does wrong hates the light and avoids it for fear his actions should be exposed. But the man who lives by the truth comes out into the light, so that it may be plainly seen that what he does is done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. We used to sit there, over on that side, uh, when this church was a little bit different, um, when there were the two aisles, and so right in at the side there, uh, towards the front, but not quite at the front. That's why it gives me a lot of pleasure to have my family sitting uncomfortably in the very front here uh, today at Mass. And, you know, this church became the kind of second most familiar church to me growing up. It was obviously my own parish church at home at St. Aidan's in Wisher, but then here was the one we came to so often when we come to visit relatives, um, my mum's family here, and with all the enthusiasm of a six, seven, eight-year-old being dragged to church on our holidays on a Sunday coming here. And although the, the church in, in many ways is, is changed and it's, it's a beautiful cathedral, there was a real familiarity though walking in and seeing those stained glass windows uh, coming in uh, today and saying those are the ones I stared at so often uh, when I was here as a child for Mass. But all those times that I sat there, I didn't 
didn't expect to be sitting there uh, at any time uh, when that, uh, no, that, that came as a little bit of a surprise, uh, let's just say. And over the past few weeks, as I have been reflecting on the, the call that I've been given uh, to be bishop here in Galloway, it doesn't sound strange saying it still, I've reflected uh, on a number of things, including vocation, um, what calling means, and particularly what calling means to me in my own experience. And so the vocation that I've had, the one that's dominated most of my life is the calling to be a priest. So I felt the beginnings of that calling at the age of 10, very young, uh, and it was kind of appropriate to that age. So it wasn't a fully developed sense of calling, but there was something there. But from the age of 10, it wasn't for another 18 years until I was a Dane priest. And there was a process going through there, and it was partly my experience, my sense of being called, but also sharing that with the church and the church hearing that call and discerning that with me. So that while a person might think they're called to be a priest, they also depend on the church and the person of the bishop to accept that call and discern with them, yes, that is a true calling, and then decide together that you are to be ordained a priest. And so after 18 years, sometimes with a great sense of that call, sometimes without, and thinking I was called to something else, eventually coming to my ordination at the age of 28. It's been a bit different for this one. It's been less than three months compared to 18 years. And there's other differences as well. I had nothing to do with that. I didn't have a sense of being called to a bishop, believe me. It wasn't something that I sought or something that I was there to discern. The discernment was done by others. And it was only when the time came and I was invited to travel down to meet His Excellency, um, Archbishop Wendia, my involvement began, which was just to say yes uh, to the, the, the invitation of, from Pope Francis to be bishop here in Galloway. So a very different type of calling, but another one that came from God. And a reminder that calls come in different ways and at different times and places. We all have to discern that and to listen to God's call. Because before I was called to be a bishop, before I was called to be a priest, it was another calling that I received. And it's one I had no say in whatsoever. In fact, it's one I wasn't even aware of at the time. And it came 16 days after I was born, on Christmas Eve, when my parents took me to church to be baptized. When I, unbeknownst to me, received the sacrament of baptism, I was called by God to be his disciple. And in that unconsciousness, in that unconscious person that I was, was the call to follow Christ, to be his disciple and to come close to him, to learn what it means to be loved by God, and then in return to love God and to love my neighbor. And then as I grew as a Christian, it was to grow into that calling that I had received. And that's the calling that each one of us has received. So today, maybe I am a little bit the center of attention, but I look forward to the fact that our Lord will more importantly be the center of attention as he is in his word and in the Eucharist. But I want us to reflect on the fact that each one of us has been called by God in a different way according to who we are, but united in the call coming from God himself, that we are all called to be missionary disciples. That means that for this diocese of Galloway, it's not just about me as your bishop. It's not just about these men as your priests and deacons. It's not just about the religious. It's about every single person within this diocese. We all have a role to play, and we all are called to answer what the Lord is asking of us. And if we are to continue to flourish as the body of Christ in this place, it is with the generosity that we are all called to respond. And in reflecting on that, I'd like to tell you what the motto is that I've chosen. That sounds so kind of pompous, doesn't it? Wait till the coat of arms comes out as well. But, you know, we are invited to choose a motto. It's not to say how important I am. Um, it is about the, the role here, and, and it is, I'd like to, to reflect on it. And the motto comes from the prophet Isaiah, and my motto is, quench not the wavering flame. Quench not the wavering flame. And it comes from the, the reading that you'll hear on the Monday of Holy Week from the prophet Isaiah. And it's one of the, the, the parts of Isaiah we call the suffering servant. 
and Christian tradition, spirituality, has taken that to refer to Christ. And the, the, the gentleness of Christ is reflected in that as well. And the, the whole two verses are, he does not cry out or shout aloud or make his voice heard in the streets. He does not break the crushed reed nor quench the wavering flame. Quench not the wavering flame. And to me, that reflects the gentleness of Christ. Not weakness. There's a power in Christ in his gentleness. But that's what I'd like us to, to reflect on. And the flame I think of is the flame of faith. And it's the flame of faith that we have within ourselves and the flame of faith that we have collectively and also the faith we see in others and how we treat that faith and that we have it in us to nurture the faith of others or to put it out. And the call from Christ is to quench not the wavering flame. And the image I have in my mind is one that some of you will see in a few weeks' time at the Easter Vigil, when you will see priests and deacons and altar servers struggling with a paschal candle if they're outside. That thing lit, and they've got their, they'll get a lighter in their pocket, let's be honest, because they're outside trying to hide it from the wind. And everything is trying to put out this flame and saying, if we can just keep this lit just for this one bit, get it inside, and then we're there. You know, but, but just if you are there that, on that Saturday night, look at that. But look at the care with which that flame is covered. But then once it's brought into the church, it's fine, and then it's shared. And other people receive the light that comes from it. But only because it hasn't been put out in the first place. Only because it's been carefully looked after. And it's with that attitude that we should approach the faith, the faith of every other person that we meet. There will be people we meet who have strong, powerful faiths. At times we have that too. There are times though when that faith can seem weak and wavering and ready to get put out. And it won't take much to do that. It can just be by neglect, by a kind of wrong word that we say, by a lack of compassion, by a lack of welcome, by a lack of unity. There are so many ways in which we have it in us to put out the faith of others when they come to us. And once it's gone out, how difficult it is to bring it back again. But if we are careful in how we are to each other and to ourselves, if we carry the gentleness of Christ and the compassion of Christ and the strength of Christ, then we can care for any flame of faith that is brought to us. And that small wavering faith of the person who comes can become a powerful flame, a light in the dark. At Easter time, we're going to reflect on the light in the darkness. And it doesn't take much light to overcome the dark. It just takes a little because it is the most powerful thing because ultimately it's the light of Christ. John's Gospel, today we are given the message. Nicodemus comes in the dark, interestingly, because he's afraid. But Christ gives him the message that God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world to save us. That's the message that we have to hear and remind ourselves of. And that's the message that everyone has a right to hear, and therefore we have a responsibility to tell them. And in telling them that, to help with whatever faith they have to grow in that, so that it can become something stronger and then something to be shared as well. Because we are called to be the light of the world. And particularly in this place of Galilee, this church is called to be the light of the world to all people. Not just those who come in the door. Every single person who lives in this place has the right to hear the word of God and to share in that. And we have to show that to them. I've said before, it was up to me. Every church would be entirely made of glass so that people can see in. It's not something we keep to ourselves. It's not something we come to share here and close the doors. We have the doors open as wide as we can. We make sure people can see in so that they're drawn to this and welcomed to that. Quench not the wavering flame. And interestingly, the way it's been put, and it was someone wiser and more clever than me that suggested that wording of it, sounds like a command. Sounds like I'm telling you to do something. Do you know what? I am. I'm telling you. I may not tell you too many things, but yeah, well. But just now, this is my command on Christ's behalf to you and to myself. Whenever we meet any kind of faith, it's not for us to judge that other person. It's for us to care for the person that comes to us with the care and compassion of the risen Christ, to love them. 
We were loved in baptism. We were given the love of God and the call to discipleship. We are called to respond to God's love, to love him, and to love every other person without exception. So let's remember that. Travelling to Lourdes in a couple of weeks, uh, we go with the HCPT, and the Scottish region is in charge of it this Easter. And the theme is, let your light shine. And we've been reflecting on that and saying, what light is that? It's not my light, it's actually reflecting the light of Christ. And if we care for the light of faith in our own hearts, if we care for the light of faith in those around us and those that we don't yet know, then how much can we let our light shine, but more importantly, the light of Christ shine in this place? Quench not the wavering flame. We have a God who loves us and cares for us and wants to hear our every need. And so we pre present to him our needs and the needs of our world. For Bishop Frank, our new shepherd, that he may know the love and prayerful support of all the people in our diocese and the strength, joy, and guidance of the Holy Spirit in his life. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously. For the people and priests of Galloway Diocese, May they respond to the promptings of the Spirit in their lives by reaching out as one to those who most in need around them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously. For the people of Gaza, Israel, and the Ukraine, and for all who are suffering the terrible consequences of violence, that the root causes of hatred may be overcome and the seeds of lasting peace be sown. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously. On this Mother's Day, we pray for God's blessing on mothers and all those who care with patient, gentle love in a maternal role, that we may show them love and gratitude in return. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. With Skiaf, we pray especially for communities in Rwanda, that those who live with trauma and suffering may know God's comfort and healing power. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For all our loved ones who have died, and we remember especially today those whose lives touched and directed ours, that they may come into the light and joy of eternal life. Lord, hear us. Lord, gracious. For a moment in silence, we bring our own particular intentions before the Lord. And on this Mother's Day, let's ask the intercession of our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers, those spoken aloud and those in the silence of our hearts, and grant all we ask through Christ our Lord.
Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We place before you with joy these offerings which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by your gracious gift each year, you are faithful await the sacred Paschal feasts with the joy of minds made pure, so that more eagerly intent on prayer and on the works of charity, and participating in the mysteries by which they have been reborn, they may be led to the fullness of grace that you bestow on your sons and daughters. And so with the angels and dark angels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim.
you are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. Make he make us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain in inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, St. Ninia, and with all the saints, who was constant in procession with the light, for unfailing love. With the sacrifice of our reconciliation to the table, Lord, grant the peace and salvation of all the world. We see the confirming faith and charity of your children from the earth, your servants, Francis of Pope and Francis of Bishop, the organ of Bishop, all the clergy, the entire people you have created for your glory. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family when you have come in before you, in your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and glory is yours forever and
at the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed Pope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but in the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, to live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
I remind you that during the distribution of Holy Communion, for those who don't receive communion, you're welcome, if you wish, to come forward and receive a blessing. If you do that, come with everybody else and cross either one arm or both arms in front of you like that, and then we will know to give you the blessing.
Let us pray. O God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illuminate our hearts, we pray, with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty, and love you in all sincerity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Right, sit down just for a minute, please. Bishop Francis has taken possession of his cathedral. Take care of him. <laughs> I bring in particular the greetings and the blessing of his holiness, Pope Francis. You see, they have the same name. Who desire to be close to you all through my person. To all of you gathered in this cathedral church and to all the clergy, religious, and lay faithful to the Diocese of Galloway, I ask to continue to pray to your new bishop. May God bless you all. I'm just going to say a, a few words, and I try, shall try to be short for a couple of reasons. First of all, His Excellency has a flight to catch. The other is, I've got new shoes on and my feet are killing me. <laughs> you know, these, the things you don't think about in the lead up to this. The most important thing I have to say to you, I shall say first, which is please get in for a cup of tea after this. 
Father David has, has got um, hospitality ready for you. Um, so please, everyone, feel welcome uh, to go into the hall after this and enjoy his hospitality. But just a, a couple of words of thanks. And first of all, to um, Father Borland himself um, for his, his work here in the cathedral and everything leading up in particular to today and today's celebration. So thank you to Father David and to everyone here in the cathedral. Also, Father Duncan McVicar is here from um, Ardrossan, and thank you for all that was done yesterday uh, in St. Peter and James too. Not, as I said yesterday, I wouldn't be exhaustive in my thanks, but obviously something has to be said to the choir and musicians. And the music yesterday was outstanding, uh, and we continued with that today. So thank you. <laughs> I love a choir that isn't there to perform for their own sake or perform to others, but it's there to lead people in singing. And that was very much evident yesterday and today that everyone was singing because of the work of the choir. So thank you for that. I just want to say one final thanks, and it's a very important one. It's to Father Willie McFadden. Um, Father McFadden has done so much work as administrator here in my absence, as in before I got here, um, in, in working. And but. I have already seen what he has done in the support he's given to me, but uh, since um, Archbishop Nolan moved on to, to Glasgow, Father Willie has been outstanding in what he has done, in the, the care he has given across the diocese and the, the great work he has done. So thank you very much to Father Willie. <laughs> Having said that, we're not going anywhere, <laughs> and I'm delighted that Father Willie has agreed to continue as Vicar General, and so I'm absolutely delighted with that, and so thank you for taking that on as well, Willie, so, so keep up the good work. <laughs> That's it. Anyone else can consider themselves thanked. So would you stand, please? I did it, stand. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.